Oh,
Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Lafayette Harris, for reminding us that Jesus is our Redeemer and our friend. I'm Reverend Clark Bradley, pastor at Fourth Presbyterian Church in the Bronx. This is our streaming service for July 5th, 2020. Welcome to, to this service, and I'm joined today by Mr. Lafayette Harris, our music director, and Elder Gloria Vidal, our worship assistant. A special welcome to our visitors and, of course, to all of our friends and members who are returning. If you're a first-time visitor, I'd like to welcome you and invite you, if you're watching on the Facebook premiere, we'll invite you to join in the chat or to introduce yourself in the, in the chat stream on the Facebook premiere. I'm going to bring up now, at this time, our order of worship for today, so especially for our First time, for any first time visitors, if you're wondering about our worship service, this is uh, what our worship service is going to consist of. If you notice the highlighted part up top greeting, that's where we are right now. And we will bring, we will move in a moment to our call to worship, which comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Just like to remind our visitors and everybody that if you want to, view the graphics that we'll be using during this worship service that have the order of worship, the prayers, the, the words to the hymns. They should, they're all found on the, face, on the church's Facebook page, but it will be in a different post than the worship service, than the live stream is. So look for a different post that has the images, and you'll come up with, you'll see all of these different images. Let's continue our service now with our call to worship. Here it is from Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. This is the great vision of heaven that concludes the Bible. This is near the beginning of it. It's verse 3. The great vision of heaven in Revelation chapters 21 and 22 that concludes the Bible. And this is what John saw. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Praise be to God, and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do come to you today thankful for all of your gifts. But Lord, right now we do thank you. We thank you for the destiny you call us to, to that, that great and joyful city that comes down from heaven that John saw 2,000 years ago. We thank you for giving him a vision that inspired not just him, but, and not just us, but believers across all the intervening thousands of years, thank you for this blessed vision of our destiny with you, where you will be our God. We will be with you forever. We do praise you for making that possible through your Son, Jesus Christ, through the renewal of your Holy Spirit. And we ask for the blessing now of, of a clean heart and a clear mind to praise, worship, and honor our Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll continue now with our call to worship. That's next in our order of worship. And Elder Gloria Vidal will lead us in today's call to worship. You're muted still. Let us pray. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we do not listen. We turn our backs on you and our neighbors, wrapped up in our own lives. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, have mercy on us. Turn us away from this dying world and help us to admit our sin so that we may repent turn to you and rejoice and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Yeah. Amen.
Friends, hear these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is in a position to condemn us? The, there is only one in that position, and his name is Jesus. So listen now to what that same Jesus has already done for us. Jesus has died for us. Jesus has risen for us. Jesus has ascended into heaven where he continually prays for us. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Friends, believe this gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. And let all God's people say, Amen. 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 And we come now to the time that uh, we would normally be passing the peace among ourselves here. So since we're all separated, uh, we can, let me see, we can stop sharing here and, and we can wave to each other here and say the peace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And those of you who are together with other people can pass the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ to each other. And the, those who are in the chat can greet each other. So while you're greeting each other, let's continue with the children's message. We'll continue with the children's message at this time. So, excuse me, not the children's message, the children's blessing. And if you have, so if you have any children with you watching this, I'd ask that you have them come up to the screen, close to the screen, and reach out their hands to receive this blessing from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'd ask that the, the children come forward this time. If you could have them come forward towards the screen and reach their hands out towards the screen. Heavenly Father, I do lift up to you the children who are they're coming to you through this video. Lord, you know each and every one of them. I lift them all up to you. And I pray that you would surround them with your mighty angels, that you would guard and protect them from harm and evil in the week ahead. Lord, I do pray that you will open their minds to receive the, the grace and the love of your Savior Jesus, that your mercy would wash over them. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless them in these summer months. I pray for you to watch over them and guard them, guard their health from the virus and from all sorts of other hazards. But Lord, I do ask that you would lead them closer to yourself. Use this, this time away from school during the summer as an opportunity to, to teach these children lessons about your spirit, spiritual lessons that reveal your truth to them. We ask for this blessing for our children in the name of the, the one who, who came to receive the little children, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, we'll continue, we'll continue now, moving on towards our announcements, but before we do, I just wanna bring up one, again, a second time, our order of worship, so those who aren't familiar with it can see where we are. You see the announcements area is highlighted, and that's where we are, so we'll move on now to our announcements, and let me enlarge them just a bit on the screen. You can see the announcements there. Uh, today, again, Sunday School is continuing. It, it's over now, and you're watching the live service, so you know about that. We have a little message there about donations, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come to the offering time. The next item is about prayer requests, because the next, the next item on the order of worship is the prayers of the people. If you want to be included in prayer or know someone who needs prayer, you can send a request for prayer to fourthpcbronx at gmail.com. The address you see there on the screen and just put make the subject line the word prayer that way I know to to uh, that those are prayer requests <coughs> excuse me uh, the next two bullet points there are um, announcements about testing for the COVID virus you can look at those on your at your own on your own and remember that you can find all of these images on the church's Facebook page. 
It'll be a different post, a separate post from the actual live stream itself. Uh, upcoming events, we will continue live streaming next Sunday, July 12th. We will have a session meeting July 16th, and we are going to talk again about our, you know, the future of meeting together, uh, when we're going to return to worship. That will again be one of our major topics. And I should have probably put it here on the announcements you should have received, by the time you read this, you should have received the, if, you, if you're watching this, you must be on our mailing list, or you're probably on our mailing list, and everyone on our mailing list received an invitation to, the, to take a survey about returning to worship, that's the main topic. So that, if you open that up on, in your email, you should be able to, you should, it should take you straight to the survey. So if you, well, of course, the people who got it by mail are probably not watching on live stream. So some people got it by old postal mail, but most people got it by email. So that will, that, that we will be talking about that at our session meeting on July 16th. So I'd urge you, as soon as you can, to complete that survey and send it in so that we'll be able to include your results in our considerations on, on Thursday, July 16th. Also, as an upcoming event or an announcement, the online Sunday school will end on Sunday, July 26th. So that will be the, the end of our online Sunday school for the summer. And we'll figure out what we're going to do in the fall when we, uh, at a later date. So just so you know, if you're interested, if your children are a part of the online Sunday school, they're still basically a whole month ahead of us. The whole month of July is ahead of us. So those are the announcements. Any announcements, uh, anything else, Gloria or Lafayette? No, I don't have anything. No. Okay, let's continue then. Our next item on the order of worship is the prayers of the people. So I'd ask you to be with me in prayer at this time. Let's be together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that, that you call us to pray that you invite us to pray, that you urge us to pray. We thank you. You desire us to pray. And we ask, Lord, that by your Spirit, that you would give us your desire, that you would share the desire to communicate with us so that, so that we will live, be, we will be living prayers so that we will be in prayer continually. We lift up to you, Lord, our prayers today. Lord, there is so much trouble going on. There is the, the coronavirus that is, that is running. Thank you, Lord, that it's, it's not nearly as bad here in New York City or New York State as it was, but Lord, it is just taking over, it seems, elsewhere in the country and a lot of places around the world. We do pray, Lord, that you will that you will bring comfort to those who mourn people who have died from the coronavirus. We lift up to you those who, who are in economic, serious economic situations because they've lost a job due to the coronavirus. We pray for those, Lord, who, who've not lost a job but who are working too much overtime because they're, they're helping people in, in health care or other places, helping people during this, this strange time of the pandemic. So Lord, there are just so many needs and you know them all. We ask Lord that you would hear our prayer, that, that, that you would hear the prayer we lift up to you that covers all these people, those who are sick, those who are caring for the sick, those who, who have lost jobs, those who are overcome by the confusion of this time. Lord, there is just so much need, and we pray for you 
to hear our prayer, to answer our prayer. So, Lord, we do come to you, lifting up to you this, the, the, the pandemic that the, the, whole, the whole world is suffering from at this time. Lord, we do lift up to you floods that are affecting people, especially in East Asia, in, in Japan and China. We pray, Lord, for you to, to keep people out of harm's way and to, to, to give your peace to people who have lost homes or businesses to the, the massive flooding going on in those areas. Lord, we also pray for people who are seeking cures, vaccines, therapies to, to help people survive the coronavirus. We ask, Lord, that you would give them wisdom to know what, what to do. We pray, Lord, that you would give them perseverance to continue the course of, of concluding their research. We pray, Lord, that you would bring, bring to us, your people, effective measures to counter this virus soon. Lord, we also lift up to you the sick and the shut-in of our congregation. We pray for James. We pray for Olive and Trevor. We lift up to you Pat in Chicago. We pray for Acusia and Acusia, for Elizabeth, for Elaine and Melanie. Lord, we lift up to you those among us and those known to us who are in need of, of your healing power, who are need your strengthening to recover from surgery or, or illness. We pray also, Lord, for caregivers. We lift up to you, Carol and Kathy and Waldy. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on them and, and all the other caregivers of our congregation, that you would give them physical and spiritual strength, that you would give them joy in this, this work of devotion that they do. Lord, we pray for all these people, and we lift up to you now, Lord, our city, our state, our nation that is suffering from so much social turmoil, from so much political division. We do ask, Lord, that you would raise up peacemakers in this time of division and unrest. Please, Lord, inspire people who will be willing to, to risk everything to, to make peace. We do ask, Lord, that you would give them a hunger and a thirst for peace, that you would give them courage that is so clearly needed at this time of, of, of conflict. Lord, we pray for peacemakers in our nation, among our people, in our cities, in our governments, so that, so that the spirit of this nation can be healed, so that the people of this nation can live together in peace. Lord, we do lift up to you this, on this 4th of July weekend, our prayers that the, 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 Lord, that the principles this country was founded on, that those inspiring ideals Lord, we ask that you would lead our governing officials and our courts to fulfill the promises that were, that, were, that were written into our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, that this nation would be a place where people can, can live in peace and tranquility, can pursue life and liberty. We do pray, Lord, for the blessings that you have given us. We thank you for the blessings that we've received, and we pray, Lord, that you would, that you would lead us to continue the work of expanding your blessings to everyone in this nation. Lord, we also pray for your church around the world. We ask, Lord, for you to bless your church. We pray especially for those who are persecuted, for the persecuted church, and ask for the church, especially in Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia, and in East Asia, that you would bless your people, that you would, that you would strengthen their faith, that they would overcome the powers that oppose them, release your power through their words to, to bring repentance and, and, and faith. Lord, release your power through their hands to bring healing. We do pray that you would 
that you would strengthen your church all over the world. Lord, we lift these prayers up to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray our Lord's prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Wow. And we will now continue our worship service with our next hymn. Our first hymn for today is In Christ Alone. choir for leading us in the hymn in Christ alone and I'd like to rem remind people that we do put the words on the screen so you can sing along so in our next hymn coming up after the message I'd invite you to sing along on that one as well so now we come to our time to read from God's Word but before we do that let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you that you are the God who calls us to pray and who hears our prayers for right now we come to you thanking that you are the God who speaks. And we pray that this, at this time that you would open our ears, open the ears of our hearts, open the eyes of our minds, so that we can hear and see the, the, the spiritual truth that you reveal to us through your word. We ask this in the name of the living word, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me bring our scriptures first our old testament readings up here and our we have a number of readings today 
they're sort of scattered, uh, it's, it's a theme, they're, they're tracing out two themes that do run through scripture, as you can see, <coughs> with our first reading, it starts all the way early in the book of Genesis. So this is a theme that runs all the way through scripture, or there are two themes that run all the way through scripture, and we're going to pick up passages, one or two verses at a time, that tell us something about these two themes that weave their way through Scripture. So in the Old Testament, we're going to read three separate verses that address these two themes uh, from Genesis 6, Job 19, and Jeremiah 17. And then we'll move to our New Testament readings. So the first verse we're going to read is Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. This is the statement that explains why the Noah's flood happened. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Move on to Job chapter 19, verse 25. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end, he will stand upon the earth. And our final verse from the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Let's move on to a number of New Testament readings. We've got two gospel readings and two readings from Paul's letters. Let me, uh, first let me enlarge it a little bit, make it a little bit easier for you to, to read on the screen. So let me actually read Paul's, the passages from Paul first, the two from Romans, and then we'll go back up and read what Jesus has to say in Mark and Luke's Gospels. So the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 wrote, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then later on in the same book, in chapter 12, Paul wrote verses 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now let's conclude with our two gospel readings. One verse from Mark chapter 10, verse 18, and then two verses from Luke chapter 5. In Mark chapter 10, these are the words of Jesus. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. And now from Luke chapter 5, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now for our anthem. We have a really special anthem today. It's, it's sort, of, sort of unique. I'd like to thank our, our, uh, one of our choir members, Bernard Mercer. He's rework some lyrics. He'll be singing, He'll Stand By You. Bernie will be the soloist. And our music director, Lafayette Harris, has arranged to have him accompanied by guitar. So I'd also like to thank Ron Jackson, uh, the guitar player on this. So here is He'll Stand By You. Feeling sad 
tears are in your eyes. You can talk to Jesus and don't be ashamed to cry. He will see you through because he knows you. And when the night falls on you and you don't know what to do, nothing you confess could make him love you less, and he'll stand by you, he'll stand by you, he won't let anything hurt you, Jesus will stand by you. So, whenever times get bad, just take it to the Lord, and He will comfort you. And those feelings you don't have to hide with Jesus on your side. See, He knows you. And when you're standing at the crossroads and you don't know which path to choose, him in your heart, cause even when you're wrong, He'll stand by you, the Lord will stand by you, He won't let anything hurt you, He'll stand by you, even in your darkest hour, and He'll never desert you, Jesus will stand by you. Thank you for that wonderful, that wonderful anthem. I'd ask that you join me in prayer now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to receive your blessing. Give us confidence that you stand with us, that, that your son Jesus is our redeemer. Amen. On this 4th of July weekend, consider some familiar words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. From the Declaration of Independence, now from the preamble to the U.S. Constitution, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, 
and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, create this constitution. Inspiring sentiments, noble words, that nearly 250 years later, this nation still strives to make real and true for all people. Words that were written with the knowledge that there were, they were not true at that time, the time of their writing, written in the hope that the nation thus founded might embrace these principles and seek to more perfectly accomplish them within the borders of the nation. The founding documents of America were, they remain to this day, stirring, honorable, aspirational, and inspirational. These documents have changed the world. Even America's enemies honor these words. For example, when those enemies publicize American failures to, to live up to its own standards, calling this nation to live up to the principles embedded in its founding documents inherently recognizes the truth, the nobility, the virtue expressed by those words. Now much eloquence could be expended proclaiming the truth of those principles. However, today I want to spend time on something different, on what the Constitution in particular, not on what it is, but what it was not, not utopian. You've probably heard the word utopia before, but allow me to give a, a brief definition. The word literally means nowhere, no place. It was invented 500 years ago by a British philosopher named Thomas More. In the year 1516, he published a book with the title, with as its title, the word he had coined, utopia. So that's the, the origins of the word. Here are a couple of more modern definitions of the word. Utopia is an imagined community or society that possesses perfect qualities. So utopia is imagined, not a real place. Another definition. Utopia is an ideal society based on notions of equality, social harmony, economic prosperity, and political stability. Again, utopia is an ideal, not a reality, because it is, as, it's, as the word literally means, no place, nowhere. Other words associated with the imaginary ideals of utopia are unity and peace. You want to see a vision of utopia? Pull up the, the graphic that is the cover for today's bulletin. It has an artistic vision. It, it displays an artistic vision of what utopia looks like, a utopian enclave. For 500 years, idealistic people have formed utopian communities trying to, to make real in this world the beautiful ideal of utopia, a perfect human society as they imagine utopia, as they imagine perfection to be. But all attempts fail. It remains true that utopia is no place, nowhere to be found on this earth. All utopias fail, some worse than others. So utopia really is nowhere, no place to be found. Now, originally, most of the utopian communities were religious, but over the past 150 years, they're more commonly secular in nature. Like modern-day communes, maybe you've heard of communes. Most of them are founded on utopian principles based on a utopian philosophy. We'll dig into reasons for the failure of 
of utopian communities in a minute. For now, let me summarize the cause as failure to accurately understand human nature. That's the basic reason utopias keep failing. They don't understand human nature. And here's, here in particular, here's what they don't understand. Utopias assume human nature is perfectible. Given the right education, utopians tell us, people will learn to behave so well that they can live together in peace, unity, and harmony. Given the right incentive structure, we set up the economy right, people can live in prosperity and freedom without strife or greed. But reality never works out that way. The utopian ideals, they'll last a while, but not long. That's a little bit about utopian failures, more in a minute. Now, perhaps you picked up the contrast I implied earlier between the principles underlying the founding documents of the United States, in particular the Constitution, and utopian ideals. In particular, I meant the perfectibility of human nature. The founders of the United States did not believe that was possible. They believed the view of human nature found in the Bible. We learned that by looking at the Constitution they wrote. The Constitution is a very realistic document. The founders of this nation confronted head-on the tragic human ten tendency to make good things go sour. Our habit of squeezing failure from the fruits of success. The framers of the Constitution built a political structure designed to withstand real-world pressures, real-world trials, struggles, and conflicts because they understood the truth about human nature. They gained this insight not from their brilliant intellects, but because they had been taught from childhood the worldview that rests beneath the documents they would later write. That worldview is biblical Christianity, which teaches that all humans are sinners. Today I want to talk about that worldview and why it foretells the failure of humanly inspired utopias. It seems contradictory, but by recognizing the inevitability of human failure, only then can a human system be designed to survive for a long time. It must be designed to survive all sorts of struggles, all sorts of failures. The recognition of human sinfulness is built into the Constitution. The framers did that on purpose. Consider some examples. Most famously, the separation of powers into three branches of government in order to prevent any one branch from getting too much power and dominating all the others. Also, no legislator or executive branch officer has a lifetime appointment. Next, procedures were built into the Constitution to remove from office all elected and appointed officials, even the president, a unique concept at that time when kings ruled. You don't hear about kings getting impeached. Those examples demonstrate the biblical theology of sin written into the U.S. Constitution. So now, let's quickly survey Scripture's teachings about human nature, starting in Genesis. The Bible clearly asserts that human hearts are full of wickedness and evil. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. That's pretty bad. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. 
but it gets worse. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart, it is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. The human heart is an incurable cesspool of evil desires. Oh, let's go to the New Testament. Let's see what Jesus had to say. Does he say something good about human nature? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus asked in Mark chapter 10. No one is good except God alone. Well, I guess Jesus didn't have a much higher opinion of human nature. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul concludes, All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. The Bible demonstrates an ultimate realism about human nature. And the reality about our souls revealed in the Bible is ugly. According to the Bible, world, worldly utopias are impossible. They will always self-destruct as the result of, of human sinners doing what they do. That is, sinning. Now, the concept of utopia has, it had already been around for a couple of centuries at the time the framers wrote the U.S. Constitution. But they consciously avoided the utopian idealism about human potential that, that was prevalent at their time. Contrast, for example, the idealism, the utopianism of the French Revolution which in a few years dissolved into terror and then dictatorship. Basing its structure, that is the, the, the framers of the Constitution based its structure, instead of on utopian idealism, they based it on the biblical teaching that all human beings are sinners. And we already looked at some of the structures they built in, they did the designs they placed inside the Constitution to protect the Republic from the sinful tendencies of the people who would inevitably hold offices. The Bible issues this stark warning, a universal truth in human relations. Sinners, they will sin, especially when political power enables them to get away with it. Give people power, and what you'll get is sin on a grand scale. As another British writer, Lord Acton, famously put it, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power, well, it corrupts absolutely. In contrast to the U.S. Constitution, many modern social movements base themselves on utopian visions. And those utopias, they continue to rise for a while, but then they crash and burn because they lack the spiritual insight into human nature provided by the Bible. Humanity cannot not sin. When you understand that only God can transform human hearts and minds, no social program, no government edict can accomplish this goal. Once you comprehend this spiritual truth, then you can actually make social progress because you recognize the limits of human change in a fallen world. Human perfection, that option is not available to us, so don't try it to do it. Don't assume it is possible to succeed any program for society must be prepared to deal with our moral failures. It must have built into it methods, plans to deal with fallen human beings. And now at this point, we're ready to come back and dig deeper into utopian ideals. Consider the largest historical example of utopianism, Marxism. Karl Marx expected the social and economic system bearing his name, expected it would create a worker's paradise, a utopian community. Marxist and communist utopias, they fail just like 
all the rest, for the same reasons other utopias fail. Because fallen human beings, they are not angels. Well, isn't that obvious? But Karl Marx assumed people did have an angelic nature buried underneath all that sin. Take, for example, the Marxist slogan. It's a beautiful slogan. From everyone according to their abilities to everyone according to their needs. Fine slogan. Can, can you feel? That? Does it touch you? The inspiring, hopeful, persuasive power of that slogan. Such a good, noble idea, and I am not being sarcastic. A truly beautiful sentiment, but unworkable among fallen human beings who will always make excuses for failing to live up to our own abilities. Human beings who won't see as needs what their neighbors think they need. Marxism proves the bigger, the more powerful the utopia, the more horrific its failure. Utopian communities, most of them are quite small. Not so the Soviet Union and the Chinese Communist Party. Political utopias that put real political power in the hands of utopian leaders. The resulting disaster left more than 100 million people dead in just the first 50 to 60 years. The cost of rejecting the Bible's wisdom about human nature, of, de of denying this biblical truth, it is mass casualties. 100 million plus dead, killed by unbiblical utopian ideals. That is a high cost. Utopias always fail for the same reason. They discount the sinfulness residing in every human heart. Jesus was right. None of us are good. Now, understandably, contemplating how bad we are, what moral failures we are, it's understandable this is not a popular topic. That's why human endeavors continue to fail so frequently. Because people and their leaders won't admit how bad we are. The human race, I mean how bad we really are. What a depressing, distressing, discouraging conclusion. Universal failure by all people, universal failure, all people, across all cultures, by all races and ethnicities. So let's take stock of what we've learned. Utopia, you know what it is? Utopia is a delusion. A delusion that we can defeat our sin. Or to put it the, other, the opposite way, utopia is the delusion that we can perfect ourselves. Put yet another way, the utopian delusion is that human beings, we don't really need a supreme being. We can make ourselves good, even perfect, without relying on supernatural grace. This delusion is just that, delusional, deceptive, confused. Utopia in this world, it is a false messiah that cannot live up to its promises cannot fulfill what it promises. Only a Messiah who can forgive our sins and heal our twisted hearts. Only that Messiah is capable of producing the real utopia, a true, eternal, and heavenly paradise. Praise God, he has provided just 
the Messiah we so desperately need. Jesus stated his mission. It's not to the healthy. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you're righteous, you do not need me, Jesus said. Well, in, in Romans chapter 12, Paul starts with this mission of Jesus, mission that Jesus' mission as he stated it, in view of God's mercy, Paul says, well, Jesus himself is God's mercy. That was his mission. In view of God's mercy, Paul starts, and then the apostle adds a short description of the work done by the Spirit of Jesus, the work of mending human hearts, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You are growing into the ability to do that perfect will. Only in that state is utopia possible. Friends, the only way to real utopia is through the cross of Christ. We find in today's readings the two themes. They sort of weave back and forth throughout the whole Bible. And in, in the readings that were selected for today, they weave through that as well. And one of those themes, one of the two themes, the complete and utter Fail, fallenness, the incessant sinfulness of humanity. Our fallenness is just bottomless. That's the first principle we've seen. The second principle, God's intention to become our Redeemer. An intention fulfilled in Jesus Christ and completed by the work of the Holy Spirit within us. These Two poles, our sin and God's redemption. These two poles, they balance the biblical teaching about human nature. We see in the continual, the perpetual failure of utopias, excuse me, evidence that the Bible's teaching about human nature, about Human sin, it's true. Contrast those failures to the long-run success of the political system built on the foundation of the biblical teaching about human nature. I mean, the U.S. Constitution. It'll be 250 years old in a few years. So have no doubt, the biblical view of human nature is correct. The brutal Evidence of this conclusion comes in the continuity of human sin across all human history, spanning all human populations. This is a terrible conclusion, a frightening, disturbing, despairing conclusion, which explains why people continue to reject it, even though it's obviously the correct assessment of human nature. Recognizing this truth prepares us to hear the good news. After hearing that, that string of depressing, discouraging facts, we're ready for some good news. And here it is. We can live with the knowledge of ourselves as sinners because we have a Redeemer. As Job declares, my Redeemer lives. The gospel of Jesus Christ assures us that God loves sinners just like us. Our Redeemer lives and he has succeeded in his mission to save humanity from its state of sin, this fallen nature that we have. He has died so that we can be born again with a new nature. The Bible understands what so many people and social movements today reject the depth of human sin. 
absent the grace of our Lord Jesus and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit transforming human hearts from the inside, renewing human minds from their core, absent God living in us, we human beings will continue on the road we have always traveled, the road that ends in destruction. I urge you to trust the Bible's witness to human nature, not the delusions of human perfectibility common to our culture today. Trust the Bible's roadmap from getting from, from here in this fallen world to real utopia. It's via the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows. Only by the way of the cross can we arrive at real utopia. So, conclusion, our conclusion for today. The good news is that despite our sin, in spite of the judgment we deserve, we have a Redeemer. Our Redeemer lives. His work is complete. Our salvation is secure. Our destiny is certain. The true utopia, there is a true utopia, but as the name implies, it is no place. No place on this earth. The true utopia is the new heavens and the new earth. So when someone tells you they have a system that will bring peace on earth, bring an end to injustice, a plan by which all people can live together in harmony, recognize what you're dealing with. It's either a utopia or a cult or maybe an amusement park. Disney World, a fantasy land, a fantasia, fantasy. That's all earthly utopias are. At least Walt Disney was honest about it. Well, every time people try to create a utopia, a utopia during this life, it will fail. Whether it's secular or religious, doesn't really matter. No utopias on this earth will succeed for long. So don't fall for utopia. It really is no place to be found. Instead, fall for Jesus. Follow him, and he will lead you to the real, the true utopia. Jesus is the only way to utopia because actual utopia, it can only exist where there is no sin. That place exists, but it won't be ready for occupation, won't begin receiving residence until the judgment day is complete. And the new Jerusalem has descended from heaven to earth. That utopia is the destiny of everyone who trusts their eternal fate to the only Redeemer of human souls, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Trust in Jesus and join all believers in the place where God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, the place where there will be no more death or mourning or sorrow or pain, the place where peace and harmony prevail, where life continues forever and ever. Amen. Amen, and please pray with me. Heavenly Father, fill our souls with your peace. Lord, Calm our minds so that we can taste the utopia, the destiny that you have waiting for us, that you have spent thousands of years preparing for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you make this paradise possible for sinners like us. Oh, we do long for the day that you restore us that we receive our true new nature, 
our spiritual bodies that will live with you in paradise forever. Amen. We come now to our affirmation of faith. Let me bring up our order of worship one last time here so you can see where we are. You see we're down towards the bottom. The affirmation of faith is highlighted in yellow. And today our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. I will bring that up on the screen now, and Elder Gloria Vidal will lead us in our affirmation of faith. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gloria. We'll continue now with our second hymn, which is also our last hymn, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. It's also known as the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and it's also known by its, its refrain, Glory Hallelujah. So that will be our next hymn.
truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Now, with our offering, when we come to our offering time, let me bring this uh, up on the screen, our information for, for giving. Of course, we can't collect uh, an offering in the plates like we normally do here. We can, however, receive electronic giving. So you can see how to do that here. You can donate to the send donations to this email, treasurer at fourthpc.org. You can see it there on the screen, treasurer at fourthpc.org. That's four at 4thpc. So you can give electronically through that means. You can give traditionally by check. You can mail donations to the church. We've printed the address there on the on the screen, you can see the church's address. So send send your donations there if you want to pay by regular paper check. Just please do not send cash because uh, it's difficult for Astrid to make the deposits at this time since with banks still in a semi-closed situation. So that is giving. Oh, also, let me add... Also, that what a number of people have been doing for the last month or so, they've been coming directly to the church. So if you want to actually give by check, but not mail it, you can come to the church and on the new bold side, walk through the gate and at the door, there's a mail slot. Just slide your, your envelope through the mail slot and we'll pick it up. So you can also give directly that way. And I'd like to thank all the people who have been giving. Thank you for your donations. We really appreciate them. We need them. So thank you for your donations. And we'd ask that you continue to remember the church over this summer. So now we will continue with what we've been doing through the whole streaming, the time that we've been streaming let me stop sharing this and bring Lafayette Harris, our music director, up, and he will bless us with our offertory at this time.
Thank you, Lafayette. We come now to our closing prayer, our prayer of dedication. I'd ask Elder Gloria Vidal. Well, let me first bring that up on the screen here. Here's our prayer of dedication. So I'd ask Elder Gloria Vidal to lead us in that. Let us pray. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits which you have one for us, for all the pains and insults which you have borne for us. O oh, most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. 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 Thank you, Gloria. So we come now to the benediction. Our service is over. Please receive God's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion of God the Holy Spirit be with you, with those you love and with those nobody loves, this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Our service is over. We hope to see you again next week on our live stream. Have a blessed week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.